I'm so glad you've joined us today for The Difference. Pastor Hagee and I are going to be discussing a moment in time that changed history forever. How did it happen? Stay tuned and find out. Thank you for being a part of The Difference today. I'm so excited to continue the conversation with Pastor Hagee about 65 years of life and ministry. People ask me all the time, what's your dad doing now? And I say the same thing he was doing then. He, <laughs> he, he's, he's still in full-time ministry. But one of the things that I really enjoy about these moments when we get to look back is in many ways we see uh, the memorial stones of God's goodness. Yes. As he told the children of Israel with mm -hmm. Joshua, you set up these stones and every time you walk by them, you tell your kids, this is how he got us here. This is what he did mm -hmm. for us. And, and you use it as a reminder. Um, when we talk about relationships like Derek Prince, he came into your life at a time when you needed direction in terms of theology. But what he did was launch your life mm -hmm. in a brand new direction when it came to your responsibility as a Bible-believing Christian to know something about Israel. Yes. What was your life like with relationship to Israel prior to meeting Derek and after meeting Derek? I had no relationship right. with Israel. I had no, no desire to go. Derek Prince came to the church and we went out to lunch, as we always did, whenever he was doing our guest speaking. And in one of our conversations, he said, have you ever thought about going to Israel? I said, no, I have not. Mm -hmm. He said, you need to go. And that's all he said. And we went on to think about, talk about other things. Shortly thereafter, uh, in our church, we were showing the film, Apples of Gold. And uh, I, was, I was deeply moved by that movie. I was sitting by Diana, and uh, she reached over and said, uh, why are you so moved by this? I said, we're going to Israel. And, and you were going on a tour. Tour, you, you, that's you, right. You yeah. were not on Tourists. a spiritual mission. You were not compelled of God. You just, no. I, I'm going to go. Yeah. And by the way, you, you went as well. I, I know. I was four months pregnant with Matthew when yeah. we went. Well, so the three of us went. <laughs> yes, we did. Made, made uh, my first trip without voting. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to see the city of Jerusalem because I knew that in the future, when Jesus comes back to earth, the capital building of the kingdom of God is going to be that city. And I was deeply moved by all of the things that I saw. I went to the Western Wall to pray. And about midway through my prayer, I looked over my shoulder and I saw an elderly Jewish man sitting in a rocking chair, rocking back and forth, reading the Word of God with tears on his face. I was deeply moved by his emotion at simply reading the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And I turned back to face the wall and I felt this overpowering thought come to my mind. And the thought was this, that man is your spiritual brother. He's afraid of you and you don't know one thing about him. I want you to do everything in your power to bring Christians and Jews together in a non-threatening environment without condition to express love and mutual respect for the Jewish people. People will tell me your father is a pioneer. Mm -hmm. And I agree. He is a pioneer in this space. Mm -hmm. He's not a pioneer as a pastor. Other people have pastored. Mm -hmm. He's not a pioneer on television. Other people have been on television. Or school. He is a pioneer when it comes to bringing Christians and Jews together because this was a trail that no one had ever even attempted to cut before. Never, never. So when I, when I left the wall, I, I said, I've got to share this with Donna. And when I shared it with her, she said, how are you going to do that? Christians and Jews have been fighting for 2,000 years. I said, I don't know how I'm supposed to do it, but I know I'm supposed to try. I got books about the Holocaust. I got a book about the Spanish Inquisition. I got several books about the Christian Crusades. 
and I told uh, Diana, I said, I think we're supposed to try to bring Christians and Jews together, and but I just, I didn't know how because no one had ever done it. This was a very trying time, this two, two years. He, he became very depressed, he really did, because he thought to himself, I didn't know this, and this is reality. This is how the Christian church treated yeah. the Jewish people. And one of his heroes, Martin Luther, right, when he felt when he saw that Martin Luther was a rabid anti-Semite, Semite, it was it was more than his mind and his his soul could could handle. And so he had to process this very slowly. And at that point, he thought the purpose of this is to teach my church. His church is always first. I'm supposed to teach my church the importance of our Jewish roots and the history of anti-Semitism within the church fathers. And that was his vision at the time. So I'm sitting watching television and the television starts describing the Israeli Air Force and their bombing of the nuclear reactor at Osiris. And, and that nuclear reactor was in Iraq. It was yeah. in Iraq. And it was under the control of some guy named Saddam Hussein. Yes. yes. So 20 years before the United States thought this was a problem, Israel saw it and was trying to solve it. Yes. yes. Menachem Begin, who was a great leader, released the Israeli Air Force to, to bomb that nuclear reactor. And the media in America was blaming the Jewish people. And I thought the Jewish people had done the world a favor and should be applauded rather than accused. So out of my mouth, I said, <laughs> we're going to have a night to honor Israel. We're going to invite all the pastors in San Antonio to come to the Lila Cockrell Theater. And we are going to invite the Jewish people of San Antonio to come there and we are going to express our profound appreciation to them for their contributions to global peace, to America, and for their contributions to Christianity. And I started writing all that down on the legal pad I had in my hand, and she said, what Jewish people do you know? And I said, I don't <laughs> know any. Start? Who are you gonna invite? Because I'm the only Mexican you're talking to I right said, now. I said, who are we, <laughs> who, are, who do we know? You don't wanna go away. We'll be right back on The Difference. Is it possible to prosper in every area of life, even in such perilous times? Are you trusting Him to lead the way and show you what steps to take next? We want to send you a copy of our inspiring 100-day devotional title, Stormproof, and a set of Stormproof magnetic bookmark. We'll also send you our Stormproof journal and a bundle of 100 uplifting scripture postcards. We're pleased to include our stylish anchored tote bag. Call the number on screen or go to jhm.org storm. Welcome back to The Difference. We've been talking with Pastor Hagee about God's faithfulness in his life and ministry, how God opened doors and made the impossible possible. All of my life, I was in an exact 180 degree experience from you because you grew up without knowing anything about Israel. And I grew up thinking every Christian kid knew how to sing Havenu Shalom Aleichem. That's yes. right. And I remember... When Christians United for Israel started in the very first year that you took leaders to Washington. 2006. Correct. You know, at this point in time, 2006, and in that press conference at that first Christians United for Israel, a, a hostile liberal <laughs> reporter asked you a question. What is it that you want to do with this organization, Christians United for Israel? And your answer to him was just a moment in the exchange that y'all had, but it impacted me significantly because I've lived with you for a few years by now. And you said, I believe that everything that has happened in this moment of my life has led up to this point in time, and this is the most important breath I've ever breathed. And I think it's important for our viewers because... They hear these things and they think, well, that's what God did with John Hagee, but God is no respecter of persons. Mm -hmm. If you take one step, God will start to open up the path and show you how to get where he wants you to go. Yes, mm -hmm. and it will not be without opposition. That's right. Here's, here's exactly what happened in a nutshell. 
I discovered there was such a thing as a Jewish federation where you have to clear all activities that will involve the Jewish people. Because if they don't approve it, it ain't going to happen. That's exactly right. right. I went down, walked into the Jewish federation, and the man behind the desk knew who I was, and I said, I'd like to have a night to honor Israel. And he almost just... <laughs> it he, was a shock. He stopped. He was shocked. <laughs> he said, uh, tell me what that would mean. And I told him, and he said, well, we'll have to have a committee meeting about that. One, two, three committee meetings, and the committee meetings got bigger and got more verbal. And at that point in time, Rabbi Scheinberg came to my office. And uh, the Orthodox it, rabbi. he's an Orthodox rabbi, a godly man. He came into my office and said, tell me, what, what is it you're trying to accomplish? Very compassionate, and I laid it out for him. He said, I, I think I can help you do that. I got up and I hugged his neck and I felt the 45 caliber <laughs> pistol on his hip. And I said, this Right is, under his prayer shawl. I said, This is my, yeah, this is my kind of guy. It was instantaneous. <laughs> kind of Faith without works is dead. <laughs> That's right. So he went back to the Federation and said, Look, as Jews, we know how to handle our enemies, but what if this man means this? Mm-hmm. We have footage of a testimony from Rabbi Scheinberg about that first night to honor Israel. Take a look. More than five years ago, when we went to the Jewish community for the very first time and said we would like to have a night to honor Israel, and it was something of an astounding concept, and in the finest Jewish tradition they called a committee meeting. I was able to say to everyone there, Let's give this person a chance. We know how to deal with our enemies, but what if this person's a friend? So there's 37 years. I mean, 37 years with him. We watched our families grow and, uh, and, and mature in so many ways. Uh, so there, there's a very deep, a f- deep feeling of, of, of love and respect love and respect. That's Rabbi Scheinberg in his own words. He's now awaiting return of Messiah. Amen. He was just a godsend to me. Uh, I can say the best friend I ever had on this earth in the ministry. And we know we'll get to see him again soon. Uh, But without his influence here in the local community, you would have never stayed with this idea long Mm -hmm. enough to see it have the national impact it had. That's true. We couldn't have. I want you to hear more of this exciting testimony when we return on The Difference. I'm so grateful that I chose differently. I'm so happy that I chose you. I get to see you become the person God intended you to be. Thank you, Hagee Ministry Legacy Partners. There has never been a better time to share the love of Christ with a mother and a child than right now. When you partner with Hagee Ministries, your legacy impacts lives and transforms a nation. Call today or go to jhm.org slash partner. You, you tried this structure for what is now Christians United for Israel, mm-hmm. you know, th- 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it was looked at as absolutely not. Oh, We're right. not going to do that. Yes. And in 2006, you tried again. Yeah. 81, you said they'll come. They didn't. 2006, you invited 400 of the nation's leaders to come. How many of them came? Everyone. Everyone came. And what did you ask from them? I said, we need to organize in America a national grassroots organization with enough strength to impact public policy in Washington, D.C., in favor of the Jewish people. And I told them basically the biblical reasons that we have for supporting Israel and being a comfort to the Jewish people, especially in times of trouble. And I said, and this has to be without conversionary motive. Mm-hmm. You're not inviting them to your church to become members. You Unconditional are support. going to fellowship with them without any preconditions at mm-hmm. all. 
And I said, how many of you are willing to do that? And as the Lord sits on his throne, every pastor in that room Amen. raised their hand. That was one of the greatest miracles I have ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. 400 preachers anywhere agreeing on anything is a miracle. <laughs> but 400 of the leading preachers in this country Leaders, who Christians. raised their hand was an exceedingly great miracle. It was a Moses watching the, the, the army of Israel <laughs> drowned in the Red Sea army kind of, of miracle. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and, uh, and uh, yeah. you, you asked them for specific action. In that first meeting, one of the major goals was not just to bring awareness to the challenges that Israel faced, but to tell the United States leadership that the embassy of the United States did not belong in Tel Aviv. It belonged in Jerusalem. Absolutely. Now, getting pastors together for church services, I'd seen that happen all my life. Okay, I think we can do that, Dad telling people that Iran is, is being run by a, a dictatorship that has nuclear intentions, okay, I think that's something we're probably going to be able to accomplish, Dad. Getting an embassy moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, why on earth would anybody listen to a couple of preachers from down the road who started out in Goose Creek, Texas? But, again, steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord, Kufi becomes a reality. Progress begins to be made. Millions of faithful Bible-believing Christians now join this organization and start to have influence state to state, district to district. City to city. And hundreds of nights to honor Israel are happening. So all of the different fruit-producing efforts are taking place. But this issue of the embassy still remains. Yes. What happens next? I had an opportunity to talk with some very um, powerfully placed people who got me an audience with the President of the United States, Donald Trump. Don and I had uh, were invited to the White House for supper, and we went there. And now, I started this journey to Israel with you. How come you didn't take me to that meeting? <laughs> Actually, that meeting was, was off the record. Exactly. I know. Very I'm just quiet. saying. Yeah. But, you know, but, I, but to what you I said. I want it publicly noted. I'm disgruntled. Yeah, but to this it. moment, experts on both sides of the aisle, Christians and Jews, kept telling your father, take this off the table. It, it was the, the non-starter. It's sure too it was. far. It, you're never going to get yeah. it to happen. They're, yeah. they're going to think you're a As kook. long as you want this, they won't talk to Bingo. you about anything else. Exactly. No. Take it off the table. So uh, we were on time sitting at the table waiting for him to come. And he came in a few minutes late and he was very cordial. He clapped his hands together and said, it's good to see you. And he sat down and started talking to one of my friends at the head of the table. And uh, after about two or three minutes with him, he said, uh, asked the gentleman, he said, now what about the issue of Jerusalem and what about the embassy? And the person who made it possible for me to have that meeting Your said, host. you should talk to Pastor Hagee. I'm sitting at the end of the table with Diana. And he said, okay, Pastor, the floor is yours. I took my Bible with me and uh, I said, Mr. President, I said, uh, God really doesn't care how America deals with China or with Russia, but everything you do toward Israel, he's watching because he is the defender of Israel. I said, and there's always this Bible prophecy and Bible promise in Genesis, the 12th chapter of God blessing those who bless the Jewish people. And I said, it would be a blessing if the embassy could be moved to Jerusalem. And I said, this is, it was 1917, this is a jubilee year. I said, a jubilee year in Israel is the 49th year that leads to the 50th that brings the year of Jubilee where God always does something that's a supernatural miracle to bless Israel. I said, 
This is the year that this can be done in line with what the Bible has to say. And I read it from the Bible for him. And I said, and you are the only person on the stage of world history that can do that. And if you will do this, you will be remembered forever. It was 2017. Yeah. And he, he paused for 15 seconds and he said, other presidents have failed you, but I will not fail you. I will move the embassy. And in due time, he did that. In due time, he did it. Take a look at this video. In 2017, Pastor had the privilege of having the audience with the president to specifically discuss the biblical significance of the embassy being moved to Jerusalem. Being in Israel for the embassy dedication was nothing short of miraculous. As King David prayed 3,000 years ago, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and all its inhabitants. Let the name of the Lord be glorified today for the defender of Israel today, tomorrow, and forever is here. Can we all shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen. Hard it, to describe. It was, it was a moment that you knew that God and all the holy angels were watching what was going on on earth. The Bible says the eye of God is on the city of Jerusalem day and night just for normal circumstances because right now God's focus is on the state of Israel and the Jewish people. They are uppermost in his mind and thinking. And I knew that he was watching and listening to every word because what happens in Jerusalem is of eternal significance. Uh, you just had goosebumps knowing the supernatural uh, the current impact that, was happening, yeah. that this was having. You're standing behind the podium. I want to hear what did you think when you saw this moment? Well, before he was called to go down um, to, to speak the benediction. Because you pray. were there when he said, we're going to have a night to honor Israel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I said, and how many Jewish people do you know? But um, no, when, when your father and I were sitting there watching the program begin and, and the various high influential world leaders were speaking, I turned to your dad and tears were flowing down his face. And I said, baby, what are you thinking about right now? And he said, I remember sitting in the kitchen of my father's home in 1948, and we were both staring at a radio. Uh, President Truman had recognized Israel as a state. And he said, son, this is the most important event in biblical history in my lifetime. He said, it totally confirms everything that the word says about Israel. And there he was, an eight-year-old boy at the time, and now here he was in Jerusalem, his father in heaven. 77 years later. He is praying the prayer of dedication of not just any nation, the nation of Israel, the apple of God's eye. And he had such a small part of the whole, right, but a very pivotal part. And it was, it was truly overwhelming. And he's always said, if Israel is important to God, Israel should be important to us. And all of that happened in that one moment of time. Just, it was just a connection. And we have had uh, many Israelis, uh, dear, dear Jewish friends of ours who participated in that event who heard Pastor Hagee. Now remember, they took a big chance on having a Christian pray oh, yeah. a benediction. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and it needed to be a kosher prayer. <laughs> it did. <laughs> and uh, they have said that it is still known as one of the most important speeches ever given because it was a prayer, it was a very powerful prayer ever given in the history of Israel. Now, 
as has been our, our norm since, you know, sharing responsibilities in leadership and ministry, when you're out, I'm in and <laughs> vice versa. So with you being yes. in Israel, I was home taking care of the church. And so I wasn't there, but I was watching. And I remember all of the feelings of, of gratitude and, and, and being proud of dad. But in my own self, I thought, well, this is the pinnacle. This is, this is the, the, the climax. This is, this is why God did not let the guy shoot him <laughs> in 72. This is why he was able to survive all of these hardships on the road. It was for this moment in time. And yet, one of the things that I can honestly say to you both on television, you've never had that pinnacle moment. You've mm -hmm. just constantly, go from next consistently to the next. <laughs> kept your trajectory pointed up. And that was five years ago. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. six years ago almost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now 83 and still climbing. The steps of the righteous ordered of the Lord. So what's next? Only God knows. From victory to victory. I Every mean. door that God opens, That's right. I go through it. But I make sure that God is opening it. Um, because his nature is to kick the door down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, his nature. Well, and, and I mean, you know, when I look at that moment in time, dad's 77. Yeah. Just like he was when he was 67 and said to the reporter, Everything I've done is for right now. Yeah. And I thought, well, this must be the fulfillment of that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, since that time in 2017, the world has changed. We, we've had a COVID pandemic. We, we, you and I shared Easter services in one of the most unforgettable services I'll ever be in because you and I were the only two people in the sanctuary. Well, but I mean, we were the only two people who went to church that yep. day outside of the camera crew that shot it. Yes. Um, and yet, the vision continues. The work goes on. Um, I feel that God has given this ministry a generational calling that has a generational vision. A and if it's a 200-year vision, then your 65 years is just the beginning of what is to come. Throughout these conversations, we've often referenced my grandmother and I want to bring her words to your memory one more time. If you want to be successful, find out what God wants you to do and do that. I promise you this, when God is for you, nothing can stand against you. It may seem like what you're facing is impossible, but impossible is what our God does best. So no matter the circumstance that you face today, I want you to believe in God. And remember the words of Jesus Christ, our Savior. All things are possible to those who believe. Thank you for being a part of this program today. I pray that you were encouraged, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon on The Difference. <laughs>